I'll go ahead and get started, and hopefully we'll have a, about twice as full by, by the time we get done here today. So good morning. My name is Tom Skidmore. I'm the director for DAS and Small Cell Services at Black & Veatch, and welcome to this session. I'm planning to talk for about 45, 50 minutes, give or take a little bit, and then uh, save some time for questions and answers at the end. And then also, um, I have my contact information in there. Many of you I've already emailed at the request of OSP. They sent me your email and asked me to reach out to you. So if you have an email for me, that was the motivation behind that. They asked me just to follow up with you. So some of you may have my contact information, but for those I haven't reached out to, I have a slide in here as well that'll have all that information on there. Here's our agenda for today. First, I'm gonna go over what is DAS for small cell. There's a lot of different nuances in how you define that, but I wanna make sure that we have a common understanding, fundamental agreement today, just for our purposes, is what I'm gonna talk about. And then I'm gonna go into our DAS design lessons. And in these lessons, I'm gonna cover both indoor DAS and outdoor DAS, iDAS or ODAS. There's a lot of principles that apply to both. First lesson I'll talk about will be backhaul, some things to consider when you're choosing backhaul and the impact that it may have on the construction. The second lesson that I'm gonna go over, I'll talk a little bit about the difference between coverage versus capacity. There is a difference, just wanna make sure that, that everyone understands that difference and how that can impact construction. And the third one is constructability. So designs are wonderful, but construction is where the rubber meets the road, right? You have to be able to implement it, you have to be able to get it into service. So we'll talk about things you can do, constructability site walk. And then fourth, the drawings. Depending on the landlord, depending on your client, the different people are gonna ask for different drawings. So we have uh, examples of drawings that you may be requested and we'll go through those and show you what those drawings look like and what's on those drawings. At the end, I wanna talk a little bit about the future trends as I see it for small cells and what may be coming, some things that you can expect, some things that may be different than what maybe you've seen in the past. And all of these things I'm gonna consider are learning objectives. I understand you get like one hour of credit for being here today, so that means I'm like a teacher, so at the end we'll, we'll, we'll go through the same agenda again and I'll ask you some questions just to, to give you some context. We're gonna cover a lot of detail today, but I'll review this again just to hopefully reinforce some of the, what I think are the key points for today. What is DAS or small cell? DAS is an acronym that stands for Distributed Antenna System. There are three main parts or components in it. There's a radio, which is your RF source. There is transport medium, which is typically gonna be fiber or coax that moves the signal from the transport out to your antennas. And the antennas are the third part. The antennas provide your transfer and receive functionality. That's how your mobile device is gonna access the wireless network. Some people refer to this as RF plumbing. Similar to water plumbing, you just need to get the signal all throughout the building. And so that's why they sometimes call it RF plumbing. In contrast, we have a small cell. You can see a picture of one up here. Whoops. Now a small cell has a radio and antenna. It doesn't have the transport inside the box. It's a form factor. It's one device. Think of it, as, like I said, as a form factor. So the key here is you have the radio and the antenna all together so you can place those. They have different requirements for placement and for implementation, but the advantage is you don't have to have a head end room. If you have a really small area, you, you can just put in a small cell, as the name implies, and you have the area covered. So that is the difference. And it's not, I'm not gonna go into detail, is it a femto, is it a micro, is it a pico? Just for today, it's just, think of it as a form factor. It's a small box with the antenna and the radio all combined, it's all in one. So why are DAS and small cell important? Well, we all like new devices, we all like new applications, and that's the big problem. Years ago, we had just a traditional cell phone that did your text and your voice calling. Well, over time, the smart developers have created new devices. So we have an M2M module, machine-to-machine -machine module, and these do things like your fire monitoring, your security monitoring, they also do ATMs. The bank needs to know how much money it has left in its ATM. So those are some initial in increases in bandwidth requirements. And then along came handheld gaming consoles. So the Nintendo Game Boy, 
and the Sony PlayStation some more popular examples of those where we're starting to see, okay, this, people are catching on. This wireless is really a, a good uh, a way to sell devices. And then along came the smartphone. Now, the smartphone, I like the definition used by Leanne Cassavoy in About.com. Smartphone, according to Leanne, has five things. It has an operating system. It has a computer-like keyboard. It has the ability to do email. You can access the web and also has specific apps. So when we talk about a smartphone, we're talking about, that's what we're talking about. It's, it's basically like a computer in your hand. I think we all understand it. But just so we have a definition of smartphone versus traditional phone, those are the characteristics that I think of for a smartphone. And then along came the tablet. Tablets actually came after laptop, but in terms of bandwidth, they're less than laptops. We saw we show it earlier in the chart. And these just continue to exacerbate the need for bandwidth demand. So what's our solution? Well, we could tell developers, stop developing. We've had enough devices. Great, we don't need anything else. But that wouldn't be any fun. We all like to have more devices and more things going, more new ideas, things to figure out. Uh, I was at a Fourth of July event this year, and I found an app for measuring decibels. So I was just curious how loud were the fireworks. So I mean, it's not essential, but it, it's fun. It makes life fun. So we're going to continue to see development. So the solution is what you're going to hear about is network densification. That is just, you're trying to get the RF signal more dense or more powerful in your particular venue. There are two main aspects. The first one is throughput. Yes, we want to download. Yes, we want to have video. We want it to go as fast as possible. So that's number one, just speed. How quickly can you get it? The second one is capacity. So when all your friends come to the same venue or if you're at a, a big sporting event and everyone comes into the, the stadium or, what, or whatnot, then what are your speeds? That's what capacity is. You want to have the same user experience for one user versus 10,000 users. So that's important as well. So those are the two aspects when we talk about network densification. Those are two keys, and those are the drivers for DAS and small cells. Now I want to start getting into our lessons. First lesson is backhaul and its impact on construction. If you've worked in the macro wireless network, then you realize that the wireless part of the wireless network is really pretty short. It's from your mobile device to the antennas on top of the tower. Once you get to the top of the tower, you have cables that run down to the BTS. The BTS connects you to your switched telephone network. And that's what we refer to as the backhaul, from your BTS out to your switched telephone network. With the DAS system, you have the same process. You have, it's a much shorter distance because you're, you may be in building or if, even if you're outdoor, the antennas are much lower, but you have the signal from your device to the antenna, it's routed to like a head end room, and then you have backhaul to the switch telephone network. And when you're doing backhaul, you have three primary choices. You can go with copper, it's gonna have the shortest distance before you need regeneration or sort of some kind of signal amplification, or you can go with fiber. Fiber is very popular just because it's everywhere in all the major cities. And there's some testing that you can done, testing that you can do or have done on the fiber to see what the quality is. So some examples of those testing are you can use what's called an optical loss test set. And that is a light and a power meter that helps you determine your dB loss over your fiber. You can also do optical time domain reflectometer, and that helps you, that checks on splicing. Uh, some of the, the DB loss through splices, or you can do optical return loss. So those are different testing that you can do on fiber to get the characterization of it. And then finally, there's microwave. I'll go in microwave a little bit more detail. I'm going to cover fiber and, and copper next, but then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more microwave. It is an option if you don't have fiber or copper available. So then when we get to deployment, deployment, once, once you've selected your uh, mode, you need to make sure that, that you have the route designed and it's clearly designed for engineers so they can plan the bandwidth and then you may have to get your permits or your licensing just like you would any other construction project. So those are things to keep in mind when you're selecting the backhaul method. Now I want to go in a little bit more detail about copper versus fiber in terms of backhaul. Bandwidth is truly the king. As I said, that's what's going to enable your user experience. How much bandwidth, can they download a video without buffering? Can they watch Hulu or some other website and watch TV? So you need this, the speed is, is really what you're going after with the bandwidth. And there's two main things to consider. One is reliability and the other is availability. So with re reliability, I consider fiber the winner. Yes, you can get a fiber cut and that may take several days to get that repaired, 
but you can build redundant rings, you can build redundant laterals, there's things you can do to mitigate the risk of a fiber cut. Copper, on the other hand, it can be kind of degrade slowly over time, and you may not realize that you're losing some capacity, some bandwidth, and it may go on for days or weeks or months and just degrades over time. So I, in my view, fiber is more reliable. And sometimes with copper, you also need to add extra, um, you may add an extra run to get your monitoring, if you want to do network monitoring, just because it has smaller bandwidth, it may have smaller bandwidth. On the other hand, if you're looking at availability, depending on where, where you're at, copper is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. So if you don't have a fiber run, then you're, you're gonna go with copper. Um, so that would be your, your backhaul of choice. If you have the money to invest, you can build fiber laterals to make it more available. Several years ago, Bill and Linda Gates uh, got involved in this government program known as E-Rate. And the reason they got involved is they, they did some studies that showed that 60% of free internet access was done either at a school or a library. And so their reasoning was to get more people access to internet, we need to get higher speeds to the schools and libraries. So they were investing money in trying to build out fiber to schools and libraries. So maybe there's other, if you need help with an investment, there may be other groups that can help you, uh, depending on your build. Next, I want to talk a little bit about microwave. As I mentioned, if copper and fiber aren't available, the microwave can be an option for you. You have some different challenges. It's still very reliable. Our engineers at Black & Beach designed a 5.9 reliability. If you have a, a bad weather event or a mass calling event, you absolutely have to have the same liability you would with a wired network. You can't call up your customer and say, you know what, there was a big thunderstorm came through, we're sorry, the backhaul went down. That's not, that's not gonna work, that's not gonna be acceptable. So you need 5.9 reliability. The things to consider when you're uh, constructing and designing this are, first one is line of sight. Do you have um, a direct line of sight through a, through a hop, to a connection point for your network? If you don't, then that could increase your cost. So that's gonna be something you wanna consider. Another item to consider is supporting structures. There are, there's a term called twist and sway. So if you put a DAS node on a small pole that is sufficient for the DAS node, it may not be enough. If you have a microwave dish and you have extra wind load on that, on that pole, it may cause it to twist and sway. So that's what I mean by supporting structures. That's something you've gotta to talk to your engineers about if you want to use microwave as a backhaul. The third one is your spectrum. FCC monitors this pretty closely. You can't just pop up a microwave hop and just shoot it and, and think no one's gonna notice. That. That's gonna get figured out. So you have two choices. You have unlicensed spectrum. To me, I almost consider it like the Wi-Fi of backhaul. Yeah, you can use it, but you don't know who else is gonna be using it. You can have some interference. So that's not what I recommend. I'd recommend you go through the licensed approach with microwave and you'll have much more reliable, uh, consistent results. And the fourth is your capital expenditures. Depending on how many, what, what you think your traffic's gonna be for your DAS system, that's gonna really determine how much you can afford on backhaul. So microwave will be most likely more expensive than copper or fiber, and again, it may be a last resort for you, but you'll wanna do your, your, your typical business case analysis that you would with any kind of other kind of build. And then just with, with the copper and the fiber, once you've planned your route, and you gotta make sure you engineer the bandwidth, and make sure you get all the proper permits or licenses in this, licenses in this case. I wanna move on to lesson two. Let's talk about coverage versus capacity. So when you're starting to build or design a DAS project, understanding what the customer wants to have is really important. You need to make sure that, that the goals are achievable for you as a, as a construction team, a design team, and I suggest that you create some sort of written agreement after the weeks or months go by, may, you know, the memories may change, you may forget a few things, so it's really important that you have a written agreement. And here are some examples of some things that I would encourage you to put in that written agreement. First one is square footage by floor per building. Are there some sensitive test areas? There may be areas on the, on the floor where they don't want the signal to be. On the other hand, there may be some collaboration areas where they encourage small groups to get together to do some design activity or some discussion brainstorming for product development, and you need to account for that in your design. It may not look like a normal office area, but they want you to make sure that they have uh, coverage in that area. And also, just 
understand that how the building was constructed. Are there areas in the building that, you know, is it, was it built uh, 10 years apart, different phases of the building? Well, you need to understand um, how does all that play into what they want to have covered. So again, square footage is important. Also, signal level. This is a number like a NIG 85 dBm or NIG 90, NIG 95. That relates to like the number of bars that you're going to see on your phone. That's the strength of the signal. They're going to have some kind of requirement as to how, how they want that in the building. Next one is going to be your frequency or spectrum range. You're really not going to have much control over this. The wireless service provider controls all of this, but again, it's a question you need to ask so you have the right equipment uh, in your design. So for example, you may have 800 megahertz, you gotta make sure the, the system will handle that. If your clients and their customers or the venue users are using AWS, that's 1721 megahertz spectrum. If they're on PCS, that'd be 1900 megahertz spectrum. And then if you've been following the SoftBank acquisition of Sprint, that saga throughout the year, you heard a lot about 2.5 gigahertz, so I see some nods, yes. That was the clear wire spectrum. I think we're gonna hear a lot more about that in the future. Uh, when I go to a conference and hear Sprint talk, th they talk about how that's gonna offload and add capacity. So I think we'll continue to hear about the 2.5 gigahertz in the future. And then there's also public safety spectrum, which can be in the 700 megahertz range. Now I, I did some checking over the weekend and unfortunately the FCC website's down <laughs> due to some of the budget constraints. So hopefully if you wanna do public safety, you, you might wanna either wait till the budget crisis is over, or hopefully you can find another, another website. The FCC one, they'll flash up a note that says, you know, this is like a non-essential activity or something like that. Um, so that may, you may have to look for another area on the, on the public safety spectrum. And then technology, that will also be covered by your wireless service provider. Are they using UMTS, uh, GSM, HSPA plus, CDMA, what, what is their carrier underlying technology? A lot of the carriers are also the last couple of years have been doing overlays with LTE, so you want to make sure that's part of your design plan. And then one thing you won't have to worry about anymore is IDEN. For those that, that aren't familiar with IDEN, that was what brought us push to talk through Nextel. Well, Sprint has decommissioned that. They want to harvest that 800 megahertz spectrum, so that's been decommissioned. Now I want to talk a little bit more specifically about coverage. What is 95% coverage? That's a good question to ask your client. What does 95% coverage mean to you? Does that mean all of your venue users are gonna have unlimited access? If they say that, then you gotta stop and say no. It's just the signal strength that they're gonna see on their phone. It doesn't mean they can have unlimited downloads. And then some things to consider when doing your coverage planning are passive DAS versus active DAS. So for a passive DAS, as the name implies, it's, it's pretty passive. We're not really doing anything to the, any conditioning to the RF signal. We're gonna take it most likely from a macro site and we have cables and splitters. We're gonna move it everywhere. As I mentioned earlier, RF plumbing. We're gonna move it everywhere in the building, but we're just simply piping it in from the outside. On the other hand, active DAS will have some kind of amplification. We'll often have a radio source like in a head end room that will provide much, signal, st much more stronger signal strength throughout your building that will provide you more consistent coverage for your users. And you might say, Tom, how do I decide between active and passive DAS? That's a good question. I would say, well, it depends on your macro, on your donor. If you think and, uh, that the donor has enough coverage, enough juice in the signal, when you take it and you run it through the building and it can make it through all your cabling, okay, then that's fine. But if you don't think it has enough energy and your building's large enough, then you may want to consider active DAS. Now one, one caveat, one thing to keep in mind with active DAS is an issue called dominance. When you are using your phone near the exterior of the building, the macro signal may still come in and your phone may originate on the macro. So then as you walk through the building, you may have difficulty, it may not hand off, it may drop. And so that's what we mean by dominance. What is the signal when you're inside the venue, what signal is your phone gonna originate on? So you need to be careful of that and watch out for that during your engineering and your construction. Let's talk about capacity concepts. Again, active DAS and passive DAS, are important things to understand. So capacity, that's gonna be your user experience. What can you download? What can you access? How many people can access it? So with passive DAS, just like with coverage, what is the macro site? 
what is it doing for you? Essentially, think of it like a big peanut butter sandwich. You have this pile of peanut butter here that's a macro, and you're spreading it around. You're spreading it thinner and thinner and thinner. So as you get inside your venue, do you have enough for everyone to enjoy? If not, then, then passive DAS may not be for you. But an active DAS may be what you need. So in active DAS, you can build a head-end room, and I'll go into that in more detail. You can add BTS equipment to that head-end room. And one of the things that engineers like to do um, is create new sectors. If you're familiar in the macro network with a cell split, it's the same com concept. You take, put more radios into your head-end room, and you add a lot more capacity. There are laws of physics that govern how many users can be in a particular uh, sector, particular radio. So by adding more radio and more sector equipment, then you can add more users that way. One other point to consider is the distance from the head-end room to the antenna. If you're running fiber, that's really not an issue anymore. Um, lots of the, the fiber runs are tremendously um, productive today, tremendously efficient, so that's really not much of an issue. Um, and if you have like a large campus or a large venue, you can still use fiber to get through that. So that's just something to think about if you're trying to do a passive system and, and you're, let's say you're doing a manufacturing facility and you've got uh, a pretty long run, uh, several, you know, maybe a thousand feet or something, that, that may not work on a passive DAS. And finally, after you've done all this work on design for coverage versus capacity consideration, you've got to hand it off to somebody. You hand it off to the construction team. And so one of the keys is to get construction involved early on, and that'll be another lesson we'll talk about in a few minutes. That'll be our constructability site walk. Now what I want to go through is an example to illustrate the concepts even further for coverage versus capacity. I've asked our engineers to do a mock-up for me today to show you some pictures to illustrate this. So for this particular one, in the upper right corner, this is our sector of the macro network. This red area highlights the geographic coverage from that sector. So in theory, any subscriber inside that red area can make a phone call. That's a great theory. Problem is, how many subscribers can you get there? This is a university campus. And the other issue is, once, once you get a bunch of users closer to it, then the ones who may be on the outside may drop. So even though you have that covered, the user experience may be questionable. So one of the things that you need to do when you're trying to consider using outdoor DAS is you take a, look, a closer look at this geographic coverage. Are there high traffic areas? Are there low traffic areas? And you can talk to the IT department. When the faculty or alumni come to visit, do they complain about certain areas of the campus? So that's one of the first things you want to do is try and identify the high traffic areas and the low traffic areas. So in this example, we're selecting the football stadium as a high traffic area. We're also selecting in the lower left one of the key teaching areas and some dormitories for the students. So there's going to be a lot of um, cafeterias in there. There's some large auditoriums where the teachers, uh, large classrooms, and then the dorms. So that's the area where we're going to have high capacity. Some of the areas, the low traffic area, we're not going to worry about as much, but we still want to make sure that there's other capacity. Um, not as high, it still has capacity concerns. So what we've done based on the analysis and talking to them about capacity needs is we've divided the campus up into seven sectors. So we've done, done testing, like I said, on the KPIs, understanding what the, what the customer needs. Each one of these sectors will have a separate radio, have its own equipment. And you see the different boundaries. The boundaries are set based on the way that the antennas are installed, the way that they are, um, the way that they point, and the way that they shoot their signal. That's how you can control the, the sector boundaries. One of the things that you may need to do as well, if you remember where the macro site was on our first slide, you may need to have some down tilt. You may have some other adjustment to the macro signal. So don't forget about that when you're all done. You may need to go back and look at it. And then one other thing to keep in mind as you're doing this, uh, we, we talked a little bit about the head end room. In this particular example, we're going to put the head-end room just outside of sector number two. We, we know that there's HVAC in the room, electrical, plenty of electrical uh, source in the room, and there's fiber capacity there. So we're going to run fiber to the different buildings. And then one other thing to keep in mind as well is in some of these buildings, you may have a couple indoor nodes. Again, this is more of an outdoor uh, DAS example, but you can also connect some indoor nodes as well 
to your, to your head injury, it's part of your system. Okay. Now I want to get into the constructability sidewalk, lesson number three. The purpose should be seen pretty straightforward to you. Engineers, they design, RF engineers, they use RF energy is effortlessly moving through walls, doors, and ceilings. You know, they have a real advantage, or the construction people. Cables, not so much. They gotta have an opening, they gotta have a way to, to go through the building. Somebody's gotta pull the cable, or somebody's gotta uh, install the antennas. So we need to have a constructability sidewalk to review the feasibility of the design. The best time to do that, naturally, is at the beginning, before you start ordering a lot of materials. So one of the things that you can also see during a sidewalk that construction team can help point out is, what is a ceiling construction? Is it a drop ceiling? Is it, are you in an executive area where it's a very expensive tile? All these things can either improve or slow down the construction process. So those are things to keep in mind as part of your purpose during the construction sidewalk. So who do you want to have on the sidewalk? Well, naturally, you're going to want to have your engineers. They're the ones that have done the design, so they need to make sure that they are there and can give everyone a preview of where things are going to go. You'll also want to have your construction team. They're the ones that have to live with it. They're the ones that have to implement it. And they can talk to the engineers and say, well, I don't know if I can get access to that particular area of the building. Is there, is there a different way we can route it? And the engineers can incorporate that into their planning. The construction team can also do sketches. They can check the head end room and do things that the, the RF engineers may not think about. The construction team also can take a look at what sort of um, supplies may be needed <clears throat> in terms of implementing the construction. By that I mean ladders, man lifts, are there certain high ceilings, is there like an auditorium, is there a, a, a company atrium, an entryway that needs to be covered, some of those kind of things need to be considered, and, and as well as core drilling. If there's not an opening, do we have to cut a hole or drill a hole? So at this time, I want to take a minute just to talk about safety, the importance of safety. At Black & Veatch, safety is extremely important. As part of our culture, at the start of internal meetings, we have what we call a safety tip. This is just to drive home the importance of safety. Typically, these are relevant to whatever season we're in. So for example, during the summer months, we have internal meetings. The safety tip may be on hydration. How do you keep yourself from getting dehydrated during an outdoor activity in the summer heat? Another example could be a backyard barbecue. If you have a youngster that's trying to light charcoal or help you with getting started with the, with, the, with the grill, gas grill, what are some just tips and things you can do to help make sure that the youngster doesn't get hurt? And the reason I bring that up is, is during your construction, uh, when you're doing the planning, make sure that the people, if they have to use a man lift, are properly trained and know how to do that. You don't want to have any accidents on your site. Getting back to our participants, so the estimating team, I encourage you also to invite your estimating team uh, for the site. They're the ones that are going to pull together the order for materials. At Black and Beach, they also get the estimates from the engineers as well as construction, so they can pull it all together. And by having them there at the site, they have a good visual as to what you're trying to accomplish, and they can just help make sure that everything is together in the proposal that you send off to the customer. And your project manager is another person you want to include. They need to be familiar with the venue. They'll be running the project. They need to understand what alternatives may be needed throughout the project. And just by giving them some background on what was designed, they can help understand and, and, and provide alternatives. They can also help build relationships with the venue owner. You may be tempted to go just walk through the building by yourselves, but I encourage you to get the venue owner and have them go with you and take you on the walkthrough. They can answer certain questions like, what are the, are there any special access requirements Is it, if it's like a federal building? They can also answer questions like, what are the operating hours of your venues at office, is a sports arena, and when did construction take place? Maybe if it's a, a sports venue, then no construction is going to happen on the weekends. If it's an office building, maybe it's during the evenings, or maybe they, maybe they don't mind you um, operating during the day. So those are things that the venue owner can have uh, explained to you, so I encourage that you have them on a sidewalk. So, and then when you're done, you, you know, you'll have your Get your team together and do a go no go based on the schedule and what you think of the venue. So here's an example of some things you might see during your site walk. In this particular picture of a head end room, if you're trying to think, well maybe can we really squeeze a rack in right in here between this other rack and these radios on the right? Well, it looks like there may be some floor space. 
You have an advantage in that you have ladder rack up above, and that can be real convenient for your cabling. But my concern would be if you do put a, a rack in this area, are you going to really be able to open the doors? It's okay, so leave the doors off. Well, can your technician really get in there with some tools? So I would say that's probably not a good area where you want to try and install a rack. So the next option is what about behind? Let's look behind the rack. So here's a picture behind the rack. Really not a lot of space back here either. You can see they have a raised floor, which will help for your HVAC installing cabling. That's nice that it's convenient, but it doesn't add to any square footage of floor space. Maybe over here, there may be some more room. So the point is, you just got to evaluate that kind of thing. You may have to either decommission some racks, or maybe they need to talk to the building owner about getting you some additional head-end space. You, another example, just for illustration purposes, look at your, your power panel, your breaker panel. Do you have circuits available? Here it looks like we've got, here it looks like we've got lots of circuits available, so that's a good, good thing. Do the same thing with your HVAC equipment. What is, the, what is the load, what is the capacity of the equipment, and do you need to put in more HVAC equipment? And then we've talked a lot about fiber and backhaul. Is it easily accessible to you in the head end room? So these are some, just some examples of things that you'll want to consider and think about as you're going through and doing your constructability site walk. So one thing I want to mention here next is when you're doing your construction, you may have to be creative depending on the situation that's at hand. So I want to introduce you to a horse and for example of creativity. This is Fred the draft horse. So in and he is 14 years old, and Claude is his owner. He's 66 years old. These pictures were taken in Vermont. You say, what is Fred doing in Vermont? Well, he's pulling fiber cable. The governor of Vermont, Pete Shumlin, is worried about his state. There's only like about 650,000 or less citizens in Vermont, and so they're not getting a lot of attraction from companies that build out internet connection. So as a consequence, Vermont ranks 46th out of 50th in terms of internet connection internet connections. Well, the governor has said, ah, we've got to do better. So he's pledged hundreds of millions of dollars to improve the connectivity of the, the internet for his citizens. Well, the issue is there's so much trees and a lot of wooded area, and it's too hard for trucks to get through. So that's where Fred comes in. And it, they love, the, uh, the citizens love Fred. He's a lot quieter than a bulldozer, and it makes it a lot less, a lot less destructive. So they're happy to see Fred. And according to the uh, Reuters article that was talking about this, the, one of the foremans that was interviewed said he can do the work of 15 guys. I mean, Fred is just, you know, pardon the expression, he's a workhorse. He can, he can do a lot of work. So he can pull 5,000 feet of cable without hardly breaking a sweat. So that they really like Fred for these remote areas. And some of the other things that Fred can do is in the wintertime, if it's three or four feet of snow, he doesn't mind. And he's got some pretty strong legs on him, and he can just march right through the snow. And the way, they, the way they work with Fred, this looks like, kind of like a, maybe an old farming harness. And if you can, you can kind of see in the picture, they got the fiber hooked up there, and it kind of goes back up here. You can kind of see the guy's hand. And so they just hook it up to him, and, and Claude just leads the way, and they just march, tromp through the trees. Uh, Claude makes the comment that one of the nice things about Fred is if he gets thirsty, I don't have to, you know, take him very far. I can find a stream or, or a river or something, he can get a drink. And also, if, if he needs an energy boost, I don't have to take him to Starbucks. I can just take him to a nearby clump of grass and let him chomp there for a while, and, and he's good to go for a little while longer. Claude, on the other hand, his fear is snakes. It kind of reminded me of Indiana Jones maybe I remember that line where he hates snakes. Claude's the same way. He doesn't like snakes. But, but, but they enjoy their work, and so anyway, that's, that's an example of creativity if you're trying to do your construction projects, things you may need to consider. So lesson number four, drawings. What things do need to be included? Uh, you may be asked by a landlord, may be asked by a zoning commission, even the customer may ask for different drawings. I don't have an example of an initial plan for you today, but I have examples for all the other ones that we'll go through briefly and just talk about uh, some things that highlight. I'll pick out some highlights of the different drawings so you can see them. The head end room is one of your most important drawings. Most likely, just like we did in the constructability site walk, you saw the head end room and it had other equipment in there. Most likely you're gonna have other equipment in the head end room that you're gonna be installing. So you're gonna to need to know where things are at. So in this one, it may be hard to see from the back, that says proposed alpha power. 
So this is your, your power plant. This is the rack where you want to install your BTS. And this is going to be the area of the rack where you install like your, your fiber control unit, your match control unit for your DAS system. So those are some things that you can put and show in your head-end room layout drawing. Another drawing that you'll want to provide or maybe requested to provide is an antenna layout drawing. These you can take like a design tool like IB Wave or something and give you an approximation of, of the uh, antennas. In the corners here we have directional type antennas. You can see the little arrow on them. We have omni antennas in other parts of the floor. And then here in the center we have a vertical cable run call out so that highlights where the, where the connections are between the floors. So this is just another example of things that you can provide to the customer they may ask you for. Equipment specs. Yes, we've shown where the racks go, but how about a little bit of detail where it goes in the rack? Most likely the equipment that you're shipping to the site will be shipped in different boxes. So it'll be important to have your engineers to understand what goes in what rack. You don't want to leave it up. You may not want to leave it up to the construction team just or installers just to willy-nilly put it wherever they want, but you can give them some guidance. In this particular one, This equipment over here on the left is um, all your fiber distribution. I showed you a vertical bird's eye view a couple of slides earlier. This is that same fiber distribution rack. This over here in the middle is your, this happens to be an Ericsson BTS unit. And then on the right, there's some more detail about your power plant. So you got your rectifiers and your batteries and where all those are gonna go in that particular rack. As I mentioned, the construction is gonna be going through walls and floors. You don't want to ruin the fire rating, so you'll need to provide some examples and details of how those penetrations are going to occur. Here's, here's a firewall one going through the duct. So these are just examples of things, again, to include. Um, you may be also asked if you have remotes, what's called a remote as part of your design. You may be asked to show how that's installed. You may have some stealthing requirements in different parts of the building. So those things can be uh, provided in some of your detailed drawings as well. Electrical routing. Where is the conduit going? The size of the conduit. You can also put in some breakers or submeters. Some of those things you can also put in your set of drawings. What about grounding? You don't want anything to happen to this equipment. The client doesn't want to ha have anything happen to this equipment. So some of the popular grounding areas are either the water main that comes into the building or the building steel. And these are just some standard grounding. Just down here in the bottom, if you can see that, it's a cable tray. This one is a rack. So you may not only have to ground your the new equipment that you're adding, you may have to move the ground and the existing equipment or modify it or adjust it. So you'll want to account for all that equipment in your grounding diagram so you know you can tell exactly to your installation team, okay, these are the racks you need to touch, these are the racks you don't need to touch. HVAC equipment. So you're gonna be adding some, a lot of equipment to this room. You need to show, after you've done your analysis, in this example, we do need to add HVAC equipment. For this particular room, we had to put the condenser on the outside, so there wasn't room for it inside. If they allow you to cut vents or holes in the walls, then you can put the condenser in there. This one over here is where the, the blower is gonna be. So we have the blower inside the room to put the air in, but again, the condenser for this particular room, it wasn't, it wasn't available. That was not an option to put it in there. And finally, you're gonna to wanna to include your plumbing diagram. This will show you some quantities and locations, a little bit different format, just easier to understand for the average person, and the building owner will wanna see that. So that concludes our lesson number four. I wanna get into some of the future trends and just talk briefly about those. If you have been reading or hearing about the small cell, you may be asking, well, how far apart is it from the BTS? Well, hopefully you saw earlier today that the, the, that the radio and the antenna are all in the same. So they're gonna be a direct connection, not gonna be running a lot of cable. We'll have a lot of long cable runs as it relates to a small cell. So that's one trend you're gonna see. Another one is electrical power. 
more than likely you ran negative 48 volt DC for a BTS at a macro site. So there's a really high likelihood based on the product specs I've seen that a macro cell may be like a 110 or 220 volt AC. So you have a different, just a different electrical power source. And in terms of backhaul, again, I think you'd probably be using fiber, but instead of doing it to one site, you can do a lot of sites. So you're gonna have to be creative and figure out how can we quickly get fiber to a lot of these different sites and many, many more sites. And I'm gonna cover, in a few minutes, I'll give you some predictions as to, as to how many small cells are gonna be deployed. And all these things impact the site acquisition. So can you get the fiber? Can you get the electrical power to the site? What is that gonna look like? How is that gonna impact you? Here's an example, ask your engineers to mock up one, what a small cell might look like, just to give you a visual on the deployment. So this box up here represents our small cell. If you look at a, a specs from like say an Alcatel Lucent, they have a, uh, they publish their specs on one of their devices. It weighs about 22 pounds. The dimensions on it are about 18 by seven inches by eight inches. So it's not real big and, and it can go top of this particular light pole is where we put it. Now we're anticipating that you're gonna to have to have some, maybe a submeter or some connection uh, to some fiber. There's gonna be some other connection devices more than likely on the same pole. Now in this particular example, engineer drew, drew it on the front of the pole. More than likely during installation, we'd probably wanna put it on the back of the pole just to protect it from cars and, and traffic um, accidents. And this blue line up here represents your fiber. It's an aerial fiber run. As I mentioned, we gotta get fiber to all the sites. You may not wanna be trenching through a neighborhood. Zoning may not let you. So it may be easier to run in, in some of the existing uh, poles uh, and the existing power space or, or whatever, uh, some of those telco spaces, some of those that are already on the air, you need to get permission to install in those areas. Maybe an option for you in terms of fiber. So hopefully that gives you a quick visual as to what small cell deployment might look like. And then as I mentioned, there's gonna be a huge increase. And in case you haven't seen those, I've, I've prepared some notes. So there's a company called ABI Research that does some research. They publish some press releases about what they think the volume is gonna be for small cells. And Yahoo Finance has picked up on some of this as well. So some of the predictions, now they distinguish between an indoor small cell and outdoor small cell. So for them, an indoor small cell is like a femto cell or an enterprise type um, deployment and they're predicting in 2014 5 million devices will ship I believe this to be a worldwide number but that's a lot of number a lot of equipment to ship and the outdoor one I did not get a specific number for 2014 but they're predicting by 2017 that 9 million almost double 9 million will be outdoor so there's a huge potential for small cells coming on the horizon so hopefully some of the things that you learned today during the design and construction phase will help you prepare for that, that huge influx that's gonna be coming to us. Now, as I stated at the beginning, you get, you get one hour of credit for being here, so we just wanna review and, and talk about some of the things that hopefully you picked up on today. And to make it more interesting, I brought a couple of giveaways here. Now, I try to find things that I thought would be useful Two things that I lose a lot of are pins and golf balls. So that's what I brought up here today. We'll go through, I can't give you a grade, so if you answer one of the review questions, I'll make them real simple, then please come up and get yourself either a pin or a sleeve of golf balls. We have some uh, nice Black & Beach pin, and we also have uh, some nice Titleist Pro-B1 golf balls. So. so the first one I wanna go over is, a DAS has three main components. Who can give me just one of them? What, what's one of the three main components of a DAS? Yes, sir. Pardon? Transport. Transport, excellent. Please, come on up. Thank you, good job. All right, and what is a small cell, or how is it different from a DAS? A quick, quick answer, yes sir. Excellent, excellent, thank you, great answer. Come on up, please help yourself. All right, I've got some good students. Okay, backhaul, there's three major types of backhaul. I didn't cover infrared, you hear about little, some stuff on the fringe, there's three major types of backhaul. Yes, sir? Plasma, cathode, 
Awesome, awesome. I've only asked for one. You get two prizes. That's, that's great. You got all three of them. Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right, coverage versus capacity. True or false? If your customer says 95% capacity will allow all my users to do whatever they want, is that true or false? 95% so coverage, will that allow my users to do any kind of downloads, whatever they want? Balls. Excellent. Okay, everybody. I don't know. I don't have enough golf balls for everybody. <laughs> Some, but you're right. That's false. That's that's yeah, totally different. Capacity is totally different from coverage. So I guess some of you can I don't know figure out how uh, say, uh, draw straws or something. Okay, constructability. You're going to want several teams involved in reviewing the design. What's one example of of a team that you may want to go with you with your engineers? We'll exclude engineers to go with your engineers on a constructability site walk. Estimating team, excellent, and project manager. Okay, both of you, two different answers, so you both can come up and, and get something. So, thank you. All right, we, we've we've gone through a lot of drawings that you may be requested. Hopefully, you, you didn't get too overloaded with with all the detail. Who can name one drawing that you may be asked to provide? Yes, sir. HVAC. HVAC. All right, very good. Thank you. Come on up and get a pen or some golf balls. And then uh, finally, we talked about uh, trends. Um, I want to ask a true or false question, but I realize that everyone answers. Um, so whoever raises their hand first, I guess. So, so true or false, a small cell will be less complex than a macro cell. Uh-oh, maybe I didn't answer that very well. True, true, yes. It's not no complexity, or that may not be proper grammar, but it's not absence of complexity, it's just less complex. You still got to get your backhaul, you still got to get your electrical power to it. And someone over here answered, I didn't catch who it was, but um, come on up and have a pen or some golf ball. So, all right. We've all been great sports today, so thank you for being here. And I'd like to open it for some, maybe some general questions and answers that you have. We have about uh, seven or eight minutes. I don't know how quickly you're going to open the doors, but uh, I'll be happy to field some questions if there's some general questions that somebody may have. Okay, that's, that's fine, no one has any general questions. Uh, we have a few more golf balls and pins if, if you are interested, or Al, I've also invited uh, one of our engin engineering managers to be here with me today. If you have a detailed question that maybe you don't want to ask in front of the audience, then, then you're certainly welcome to come up as well. So, one more chance, anybody have any general questions? You don't have to, just if, if you want to, that's fine. I believe so. I believe so. Yes. Yeah, welcome. All right. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Hope you enjoyed your hour. Thank you very much.